Hello and welcome to another edition of Thick Slices and Deep Cuts. Uh, today I will be uh, discussing and ranking the albums of one of my all-time favorite bands, uh, that is Porcupine Tree. Uh, so this is Stephen Wilson and company. Uh, just an incredible, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily have a favorite band, but I mean these guys are basically tied for first. I mean there's, historically I guess you could go back to Dream Theater, but then in more recent years it's pretty much been Opeth and Porcupine Tree or whatever it is that Stephen Wilson is up to. Um, so just so much to talk about. Uh, I've seen the band live in their heyday. Uh, I, I love everything they do. They have 10 proper studio albums. They have so much more music beyond the 10 studio albums. Uh, but uh, as far as ranking these, uh, I checked with uh, Prague Archives and there's one album that I thought might be a, an actual full-length studio album, but they're treating it as an EP. So, um, so I left that off here, but I will uh, certainly speak to it uh, later on. Uh, so you've got, you've got 10 studio albums. Um, I think that the roots of this band go back to just Stephen Wilson uh, messing around at his house, doing just space rock, psychedelic, experimental stuff. Uh, in the late 80s um, and then the band went all the way through about I guess 2010 2010 uh, and at that point I think you know according to Steven I think he felt like he had done everything he could do with that particular band and that particular basic lineup uh, and he had already uh, released one solo album at that point uh, other side projects that I'll get into later but at that point uh, he had uh, released one solo album and was working on another massive solo album and I think his solo work is great uh, and it's really just a continuation of Porcupine Tree so if you miss Porcupine Tree I would just say while that sucks just check out the Stephen Wilson solo work because it's just phenomenal uh, it's just basically Porcupine Tree continued it's basically this is basically Stephen Wilson's vision uh, he's got great you know great uh, members with him. Gavin Harrison has got to be one of the all-time greatest drummers on the planet. Uh, at one point, he was also playing in uh, King Crimson while playing in Porcupine Tree. I mean, it doesn't get much more impressive on a resume than, uh, than that. But uh, uh, So, okay, without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll get right into it. Um, I'm going to rank these. Not easy to rank. I think I knew my top, you know, three, maybe my top four. Um, and I have my bottom four ranked in a way, but I I really like all of these albums. So coming in at number ten, just an excuse to talk about an excellent album. Uh, at number ten, I'm gonna go with their debut uh, from I guess this was released in '91, uh, but it's called On the Sunday of Life. And while this is called Porcupine Tree, which is a goofy name because the music at this point was goofy, it was just spacey and experimental and quirky and all these these are like a bunch of novelty songs this is Stephen Wilson just doing demos in his bedroom speeding up his voice and doing goofy things and adding strange samples and there's a lot of uh, you know humor uh, throughout this this basically is a uh, it's called Tarquin's Seaweed Farm from 1989 which was a long demo and the Nostalgia Factory from 1991, which was another long demo. And it's my understanding they basically just took the best of those two demos, Delirium Records, so this is on Delirium Records, they took basically the best of those two demos and made one 75-minute uh, debut album. Um, I think a lot of people rank this fairly low, um, and I guess when you hear this, you're not sure what direction... Uh, Steven's going to take this project in. Uh, like I said, it's very goofy and experimental, but it's got, you know, hints of, you know, Pink Floyd in there, but just tons of experimentation. Um, Jupiter Island. I mean, I swear half the songs, his voice is sped up. Uh, the Nostalgia Factory, the song. Uh, Radioactive Toy. I saw him play that. I think he was as a solo artist at that point. So as a solo artist in 2013, he actually played Radioactive Toy. Uh, live. So that goes all the way back to the beginning. Uh, Footprints is a good one. 
Another goofy, quirky one, Linton Samuel Dawson. There are 18 tracks on here, and it's 75 minutes, so it's kind of hard to figure them out. So if you listen to this, just take notes. I would say look at Jupiter Island, The Nostalgia Factory, Radioactive Toy, Footprints, Linton Samuel Dawson, the goofy one. Uh, and The Swallows Dance Above the Sun is really cool. And there's a surprisingly hilarious uh, clip at the end. He's in the 60s uh, American Propaganda albums. As am I. I've been influenced by him. I've dropped stuff into my uh, recordings that I do. But uh, there's a clip in there that came out of nowhere. It had me laughing. Uh, so that's a good one. Um, <laughs> Begonia seduction scene. Just goofy stuff. Uh, it will rain for a million years and ends in... Um, you know, I, I enjoy this album for what it is. Like I said, it's just a, just a collection of a ton of novelty songs. But they're all well done. And this is the only album, uh, well, I'll explain that in a moment, but this is really the only album here that has uh, just drum machines. Um, but I like it. It's cool for what it is. You're not going to find this sort of style on any of the other Porcupine Tree releases. Uh, and for that, I really enjoy it. And I think it's just, I love listening to the way Steve puts the songs together. Just You can tell he's got immense talent, even in the beginning, when he's just doing these, like, homebrew bedroom recordings. Um, so, yeah, there you have it. Uh, at number 10, uh, you know, I don't know why this gets lower ratings, but I think it's good. I, I have it coming in at number 10, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. So, uh, at number 10, on the Sunday of life. Uh, okay, so coming in at number 2, um, you know, just yet another... Quality, excellent, cool, one-of-a-kind album. Just like that, the, the first album I ranked here, um, this one has its own unique quality you're just not going to find on the other albums. Uh, so at number nine, I have the second album uh, from 1993. I have Up the Downstairs. Uh, this is just... Um, just much more advanced from the, uh, the first album. So at this point... I'm hearing things, I mean, I'm hearing this, like, generalized Pink Floyd, space rock, ultra-melodic uh, stuff that, that Steve and Porcupine Tree are known for throughout. Uh, but here I'm hearing, um, there's a band I like, and I like the band from about this era, too, and I can tell he liked them, too, uh, Osric Tentacles, just a space rock jam band, psychedelic band, very cool band. Uh, and also a, a group I really enjoy, uh, Alex Patterson and Company. It's called The Orb. Uh, they're just a, you know, like an ambient, you know. They make ambient music almost like like rock or something like that. But I can tell he's got all these, he's got this genre, his own thing going on with a Pink Floyd bass, but he's also got this Osric Tentacle thing going on and this Orb thing going on, and they all kind of collide here in just just a cool, unique vibe to this album, um, which starts with a cool one, Synesthesia. I think I said that right. Synesthesia. Uh, Always Never is great. I love that song. Uh, that's one I would definitely uh, check out, and I probably should have put it on this playlist, but that's all right. Uh, up the Downstairs of the Song. Uh, there's a cool, uh, if you can find it on, on YouTube, there's a cool version of them playing Up the Downstairs Live at Nearfest. I want to say it's about 2001. Very cool. Um, Small Fish. Uh, Burning Sky was, I think, Always Never and Burning Sky are my favorite. Burning Sky just had this cool, ultra melodic, busy guitar thing. I think he's using an open string and doing these cool patterns on different open strings. Uh, you know, and then the final track, Fade Away, is just absolutely excellent for a concert track. Just real way, nice way to drift out. Uh, also, um, this was originally done with a drum machine. Gavin Harrison, when he joined the band in 03 or 04, this was reissued in 04. And Gavin Harrison now does the drums for this. So, you know, I, have, I honestly will admit I have not heard the original version. I've only heard this version with Gavin Harrison on drums. And it sounds awesome. So, again, this is one of my favorite bands of all time, and this is what I'm talking about. When you've got this album coming in at number 9 of 10, and I'm telling you how unique and cool this one is, 
um, just speaks to how great the catalog is. So, um, so here you have it. This is 1993. Um, you know, no more of the novelty songs, but you still have plenty of experimentation. You know, you've got super long songs, two songs over 10 minutes, a seven minute song, but you've also got, you know, what do you have? Two, three songs under a minute. So it's just short, quick little interludes into five minute songs, into 10 minute songs and everything in between. So just great stuff. Um, coming in at number nine, an album I really enjoy. And I think I enjoyed this the most when I revisited the catalog. Even though this is coming in at number nine, I think I spun this one the most. I had the most time uh, getting re-familiarized with, with Up the Downstairs. So there you go. Number nine, I've got Up the Downstairs. Um, okay, coming in at number eight. Um, just another awesome, excellent album. From 1995, I have their third album. I have The Sky Moves Sideways. Um, at this point, uh, Stephen has brought in the band. The first incarnation of the band as we know it. So at this point, he's got... And he had contributions on Up the Downstair from these guys as just session people on a song or two. Um, at this point, he's got Richard Barbieri, this guy on keyboards. He's got Colin Edwin on bass. Uh, and Gavin's not in the band yet, although he ironically played drums on the album before it, on the re-release. Uh, and you've got Chris Maitland, the original drummer for the band. Um, so that's the, the 90s through, you know, 2000 or so. That's the 90s through 2000 uh, lineup. Uh, and what can I say about this album? It continues where Up the Downstair left off. So you've got uh, more just awesome space rock. This time you've got the sky move sideways, the song. So what is that? Eight, 18 and a half minutes as track one, and then it's also the final song at 16 plus minutes. So you've got this 35 minute song cut in two and bookending this album. Uh, I think we heard The Moon Touches Your Shoulder to begin this thing. That's an excellent one as well. Um, he re uh, they recorded a song called Stars Dive during these sessions, and for some reason he left it off the original release, but uh, it was from those sessions, and it's included on, I've got a special edition, so it's included on here with uh, another mix of the sky moves sideways, uh, along with uh, these improvisations called Moon Loop. Uh, so just a, you know, just an excellent album. And by the way, I don't mean to review these chronologically. I know number ten was the first album, number nine was the second album, and number eight was the third album. I just feel like in classic Stephen Wilson Porcupine Tree creative form, that's what a good band should do. Their first album should be awesome. Their second album should be even more awesome. Their third album, they just keep evolving. And that's what this band is doing throughout the 90s here. They're just continuing to evolve and try different, either different styles or advance their existing styles. And it's getting better here. And again, you can't help but notice the same influences here. Just ultra like Pink Floyd, Osric Tentacles, and The Orb. So as a fan of all of that, I just, I'm, I'm really... I couldn't tell, how, I really couldn't tell how to rank uh, up the downstairs, the side moves sideways, and the next one I'm going to rank because they're all pretty much interchangeable. You know, nine could be seven and seven could be nine and, and everything, every other combination of that. So because I couldn't figure them out, I just decided we're going to, you know, we'll just go uh, somewhat chronologically here. Uh, so just a big fan of this album as well. So um, at, at number eight, I've got 1995's uh, The Sky Moves Sideways. Uh, okay, at number seven, um, I swear I am not going chronologically, but at number seven I have their fourth album, the one after The Sky Moves Sideways. I have, uh, from 1996, I have Signified. Um, you know, I think we heard earlier, we heard a song called Sever, uh, and that's on here too. Um, this is the first album, I think, there's, it's still a complete space rock, it's still very drifty and experimental, but, but it's taking the, the complete, you know, gone is the novelty and the quirkiness of the first thing. Um, at this point, all of the, the, you know, I keep saying the Osric Tentacle orb vibe of the previous two albums 
is now, uh, you know, stripped down into a way where you actually have like a, a rock band here. You've got a progressive rock band at this point. They have structure to their songs, so while everything is drifty, and some of the songs are kind of long, but nothing too insane. You've got real songs being crafted here. I think the, the original release here has 12 songs, and you've only got one, two, two interludes, so you really, you definitely have 10 full tracks, but they're all on the three, four, five, a couple seven-minute tracks. But you really, this to me, this is the first album where the band became like a, a band, you know. It's not, it's not these, it's not total ambient anymore, it's, it's focused. Uh, I think the opening track, well, there's an opening intro called, called Born, Live, Die, but the, the title track, Signify, is an instrumental. It's some sort of nouveau version of King Crimson. It, it just reminds me of, like, nouveau Crimson. Uh, the Sleep of No Dreaming is great. You can hear these vocal harmonies on later albums, but this has a lot of those lush vocal harmonies. Uh, Waiting uh, was probably the first thing I heard from this. That was, I suppose, if there was a single from this album, that was this. Um, Waiting Phase 1 and 2. We heard Sever. Uh, Idiot Prayer is cool. Every Home is Wired is an excellent one. Uh, just again, really catchy, hooky vocal harmonies. Uh, the final track, Dark Matter, is probably the, the most well-written thing Porcupine Tree has done up to this point. So by the fourth album, I think this, the, the ending track, Dark Matter, is probably the, the most impressive thing they've done. I think maybe there are other tracks that have moments that make you go, wow, that was awesome. But I think, um, I think on this, uh, this album, Dark Matter, is probably, I don't know if it's... It might be my favorite track on the album, but it's just definitely the most impressive uh, thing they've done to this point. Um, you know, I, I've just, I've got uh, this with a, a bonus disc called Insignificance, uh, which I guess are the other tracks from the album. Uh, there was a track from this session called Color Flow in Mind. That was great. I don't know how it did make the album, but we'll get to that later. Um, so, there you go. At, uh, at number seven, I swear I'm not going chronologically, but at number seven, I have their fourth album from 1996. Uh, also, this was their last one on Delirium Records. Uh, so, Signify at number seven. So, their first four albums were all on Delirium Records. So, this was what I would call the first phase of the band. Uh, by the way, I believe they have three phases. So, we just completed basically phase one. Um... They had a middle phase and a like a final phase as well. Um, so let's see. That was number seven. So we're at number six now. Um, again, I could have flipped this with my number five. It was kind of tough here, but uh, I will break the cycle of the chronology uh, and go with at number six. I'll go with their sixth album. So not their fifth album, but their sixth album from 2000. I'm going to go with Lightbulb Sun. Uh, again, just a heck of an album. Um, recorded at No Man's Land in, uh, in Wales. Um, very cool album. Kind of a, a mellower album for them at this point. But still really good. Just ultra melodic. Um, the title track is excellent. Uh, She's Moved On. Is, Porcupine Tree is so good at being so depressive. I mean, the lyrics on that will make you... Pretty bummed up. Man, it's such a good song. Uh, last chance to evacuate planet Earth before it is recycled. It's just a totally, uh, what I would call uh, a deep cut. Totally underrated, overlooked gem on here. Uh, Hate Song is good. They played that one live with a, a years later. Uh, you know, Russia on Ice is another good, long, cool one. So this has 10 tracks. I think I like about, you know, half the tracks. The other half I don't not like. I just, I think this has about five standout tracks on it. Um, I think just, at this point, the band has, they still have the spacey element. You know, Last Chance to Evacuate Planet Earth is an acoustic one that does get kind of, kind of drifts out there. They still have their good drifty reverbs and delays and their dreamy harmonies and all those good things that we love about the band, but uh, this one is, you know, 
they're becoming more and more focused to go with all of their drifting, which is great. That's how they pull you in. They pull you in with the just these really strong structured songs with hooks, but they still add that just total gloss of of just drifty, dreamy uh, reverbs and delays and all of those uh, great things. Um, so again, I originally had this at five, and I think it's a heck of an album. Um, I just, you know, you know how these rankings are. I could do this in a month, and it would be slightly different. So, um, so there you go. Um, coming in at number six, um, and this one was on. I, I'm not sure what the original label was that this was on. I want to say it was on Casco, but. Uh, this comes from what I call the uh, the second era of the band. I said they have three phases, three eras, three phases of the band. This was part of that second or middle phase of the band. Uh, still with the uh, the original lineup of uh, Wilson, Barbieri, Edwin, and uh, Chris Maitland on drums. Uh, so there you have it. At number six, I've got uh, from 2000. We have uh, Light Bulb Sun. So. Uh, I'm looking at the clock. I've got limited technology, so I think what I'm going to do here is pause now that we're halfway through the list. So we've done 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. I'll do a quick break, and then we'll and, do the uh, I'm back. Five. You're right back. So uh, we left off with uh, ranking 10 through 6. So these top five, obviously we're talking about one of my favorite bands, so these top five are getting to be all classics. Um, these previous ones, I think, are all classics. I think they put out ten albums that were all classics. That we're just uh, we're just going to keep going with uh, keep rolling along here. So at number five, um, I have uh, from 2009 their final album, their tenth and final album. Uh, I've got uh, the incident. So uh, this is the first album I'm talking about that features. Uh, Gavin Harrison is a, is a member of the band. I know he went back and drummed over some drum machine work on Up the Down there, but at this point, he's been in the band. Uh, and this is their final album from 09. Uh, the Incident is two discs. So the first disc is a concept called The Incident. I guess there's a storyline. Uh, and then it also has about, you know, I don't know, about 20 minutes of music on the other disc. Uh, songs that are cool and mellow, but don't really have the same... Uh, they don't really, they're not really connected to the first disc. So it's probably why that they're on their own disc, but very cool. Um, you know, I remember being somewhat disappointed when this came out. Um, I think this might be the only time that fans may have been disappointed with the release. Because I think while maybe early albums from their career may be considered... Not as good as this. I don't think anybody was disappointed when they came out. I think Porcupine Tree was fairly unknown, and the work was cool, and you could see this trajectory happening. So I don't think anybody was disappointed with the early work. I mean, all the early work is great, but I think this was maybe the one time in their career where the fans were waiting and anticipating something. And I mean, at this point, Porcupine Tree had been on a pair of doing classic albums, raising the bar, and hitting that bar that had been raised, and hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. And so when this came out, it was a little bit of a disappointment. But, but I always liked it. And uh, in hindsight, I think it's actually really cool. Um, you know, The Blind House is the first full song. I love that song. I mean, the chorus on that is so catchy. Uh, Gavin Harrison does a little thing where he's hitting the china, and there's just a cool chord that's basically my favorite kind of chord to play on the guitar. Um, you know, uh, what's another one? Uh, the Incident, the song is cool. By the way, The Incident, and I think it's Circle of Manias towards the end. I think those are the two songs. There may be one other in here, but those are the only two songs where Porcupine Tree and Stephen Wilson, they use a seven-string guitar. So if you're like, I wonder what Porcupine Tree would sound like super down to with a seven-string. Well, what happens for about, for two tracks and about seven or eight minutes on the show. So if you really want to hear that, you can find it in here. So I thought that was cool. Um, Time Flies is the long one. Uh, I think that one's an excellent song. Uh, super catchy, great, great lyrics. Um, really good acoustic playing, super catchy. It's an instant classic. Uh, I 
always love octane twisted. Another cool one. And then um, I drive the hearse, finishes it off. Um, I will say this, there are probably far too many like one and a half, two minute songs like Segway songs that I wish would have, it's okay that they're short, but I wish maybe they were more like three minutes so you could get like a, a song, a feeling of a song, like a feeling of a, of a hook or a feeling of a, like the opening track is a minute 55 of just hit, of the band hitting a chord. Then you get a song, but then you've got a minute and a half song and a two minute song. Then you get a couple of, you know, songs, but then you get another minute 48 followed by a two minute. So you just keep like getting these delays in the action of the, the meat of the uh, the thing. And again, I like a few of those, but it just seems like there are too many on here. And then, you know, after time flies, you got degree zero of liberty in minute 45. Um, but the best one is uh, the seance is two and a half, but it goes into circle of Manias, which is two and a half. So you... And they connect well. They should have just been one track. Uh, so those connect to make like one good five minute piece. So that's probably the highlight of those shorter tracks that are inter interspersed with all the uh, the meat of the uh, thing. There's also a song in here called Drawing the Line, which has so much promise and for whatever reason, man, that chorus just bugs me. I hate to say that, but, uh, but enough about that. We'll, we'll stay positive with it. But like I said, it's got good stuff on here. It's got a little bit of seven string action. It's got a concept here. Just a lot of little uh, intermediate tracks, uh, but still cool. And again, the uh, the second disc, Flicker's cool, Drifty, Bonnie the Cat's cool, kind of strange. Black Dahlia is melodic, and Remember Me Lover is uh, really melodic. So it's, you know, the things that I complain about are usually the shortest tracks, and they're okay. It's fine. I mean, it's good. I just, it might have helped if he had maybe remove two or three of those short tracks. You know, maybe streamline this down a little bit more, but minor, minor complaint. Um, and again, I think the disappointment with this was just simply that they had been hitting home runs with like every album. At least the previous three, they were just hitting home runs every time. So when this came out and it was only a double, I think people are a little bummed, but uh, I think Stephen Wilson may have been slightly down on this too. I Or just... You know, this was the last album of the band. You know, maybe he was just... I think he felt like he had done everything he could do with, with this band. At this point, I think this album kind of shows. You know, I don't know what new ground Porcupine Tree was necessarily tackling here a little bit, and it's still cool, but, uh, you know, uh, but it's still a heck of an album. Uh, you know, what else can I say? Um, I, I used to be disappointed, but you know what? I used to be disappointed, but it's my number five out of ten awesome albums. So, uh, so there you go. At number five uh, from 2009, their final album, The Incident. Uh, okay, man, down to number four here. Okay. Um, this is from number four, 1999. I have uh, Stupid Dream. Um, this is what I would call the other album from their uh, from their middle era, their middle phase. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what label this was on. Was it on K-Scope, Snap, or one of those labels? But this is from their middle era. Um, and I just... Man, this is their one album from back in the day. Their one non... Non Gavin Harrison era album that just is, a, is an absolute gem. Uh, the song Even Less is great. Um, what are the other ones? Uh, Don't Hate Me. Man, Don't Hate Me is a great song. They've got a great version that they do live, and then Stephen Wilson, as a solo artist, uh, does a version of it. So uh, if you like that song, man, you can find all kinds of different. There are at least three versions of that song out there. Uh, Baby Dream in Cellophane is, is an absolute underrated deep cut gem. Uh, Stranger by the Minute, I believe that's the first song I ever heard from Porcupine Tree. Years before I got into them, I, I knew what Stranger uh, Stranger by the Minute and the song Light Bulb Sun. And uh, I thought they were cool, but I guess I wasn't ready for it yet. I was still in this like really progressive metal, like heavy progressive metal phase. And I wasn't ready for the more melodic you know, 
uh, stuff at that point. Um, a Smart Kid, the other fabulous deep cut underrated gem. I think I played Baby Dream and Cellophane and A Smart Kid on this playlist already, but uh, uh, just absolute gems of songs. Uh, just everything on here, piano lessons, the the just the, the vibe on this is just good. It's got good energy. It's the first album that's not quite so... And again, they're all kind of... They all have a little bit of that space rock. I mean, there's there's a dreamy, drifty quality to, to every Porcupine Tree album. So I would say that it still has those classic dreamy, drifty... Uh, sometimes I look at music in colors, and Porcupine Tree is a blue color. Dreamy, drifty, blue. Uh, and this album just dials that in and this is the first album that really uh takes that on so they you know i think the album before this was signify in 96 fast forward two and a half years later and they've really come a long way they've really refined the sound at this point so um so yeah coming in at uh at number four uh from 1999 i've got uh what is this their fifth album um i've got stupid dream from 99. Uh, yeah, here we go. Number three. I mean, these are all number ones at this point. At number three, uh, from 2005, I have Dead Wing. You may not say Dead Wing on the cover or even the logo of the band, but I assure you it's on there. Um, man, what can I say? I think... This was when I actually really got into the band, was about 05, and this was just, just hitting. Um, Deadwing the song, I mean, this is what I call that final, that third phase, that third era. Gavin Harrison's in the band at this point. Um, this is their more metallic era. So, their first out era was the first four albums on Delirium Records. Total space rock, total space rock. Very cool, total space rock. Their second era was, you know, 99 to 01, something in there. And that was cool, and that was just really good, dreamy, drifty songs. Just songs. Um, but once Gavin joined the band, the way his drumming style, you can hear him on here, just very, uh, I think Stephen Wilson described it as muscular, and it's totally technical and muscular. And so Stephen just adapted the sound to finally play, you know, some, you know, metallic, heavy riffs. So when Gavin was in the band, that's pretty much what they, uh, uh, kind of the direction they went in. I hate to say progressive metal, heavy prog, whatever. It was the heaviest porcupine tree ever got. Uh, the song Deadwing is great, very relentless. Uh, Adrian Ballou of King Crimson makes a cool, uh, just a real cool, quirky solo uh, in that one. Just a great song. Uh, we heard Shallow earlier. I know Richard Barbieri said it was his least favorite Porcupine Tree song, but I really dig it. It's the one time in their third phase where Stephen Wilson just wrote a, a real good, punchy song with good hooks. Just a heavy throw it, throwing down type of song. Um, Halo's catchy. It's a good one live. Uh, they've got this cool one arriving somewhere. It's 12 minutes, and it just has that, that again, that dreamy, drifty quality. Uh, goes everywhere. I'm not a big lyric guy, but it's a cool thing. It's about somebody that's arriving somewhere, gets in a car crash, and dies. Arriving somewhere, but not here. It's a very, very cool uh, concept for lyrics. Um, Michael Ockerfeld uh, has a guest solo in the breakdown of that song. Um, as uh, Stephen Wilson had worked with uh, with Opeth during their heyday, so. Uh, so he befriended uh, Mike, and Mike's on here as well. So you've got guest appearances from Adrian Ballou of King Crimson and Michael Ockerfeld of Opa. That's pretty cool. Um, Mellotron Scratch is cool. Uh, Open Car is yet another one of these, like, heavy, one of the heaviest tracks they ever did. Uh, and then it ends with two cool ones. Start of Something Beautiful is uh, it's cool. It's got an odd time signature pattern, but it's a cool one. And then uh, it finishes with Glass Arm Shattering, which is... Probably the, the driftiest, the great way to end the album. Melodic, it's just a beautiful, melodic, drifty one. Um, but just a great album. It's just got heavy parts, dark, drifty, catchy, punchy, you know, 
groovy. It's got it all on this one. So uh, coming in at number three uh, from 2005, I have uh, Dead Um Okay. Coming in at number two uh, from 2007, Fear of a Blank Plan. Uh, man, just another incredible album. So they're just, this is them and they're just, they're, they're hating, just hitting home runs with every album. Uh, what, what to say about this? Um, you know, the song Fear of a Blank Plan, this is back in 07, but this is already about kids that just are, you know, lost on their, on their iPods and their cell phones and their digital world. And that was back in 07. Uh, but he, and he was already talking about it, how kids were already becoming disconnected with reality. But uh, Fear of the Blank Planet, the song is great. My Ashes is so cool. I don't know what effect they have with the keyboard, but it just sets the whole song off. It's a very cool, mellow one, but dark. And that's the ties is a three-parter long 17-minute track with a guest solo from Alex Lifeson of Rush. Yes, that, that Alex Lifeson of that band Rush. So that's incredible. It's just, it's got all these cool phases to it. Like I said, three different phases. Just so, so awesome. Uh, sentimental is what you think. It's a good one, but it's probably the, I don't know if light's the word, but it's just, it's not dark. It's very melodic. Uh, way out of here, we heard earlier the live version. Robert Fripp of King Crimson uh, adds a strange, one of his strange soundscape solos to the end of it. Uh, and then it ends with a really dark one that has a really good climactic ending to the uh, to the album called Sleep Together. So uh, just an absolute incredible album. Uh, John Wesley, who I who plays with them live, he's like a second guitarist and a backing vocalist. He's guesting on here. Um, there's an EP that goes with this. Uh, much like The Incident had four songs that are on a second disc, this has a EP called Mill Recurring. Kind of the same thing of songs that are cool from this recording session but don't quite fit with the with the theme of the album, but uh, if you like what you hear on this, no recurring is a cool EP to check out. Um, I saw them uh, at Park West in Chicago in 07 uh, on this album cycle and on this tour. Man, it was incredible. It absolutely blew me away. It's a 1,000 seat venue. There's not a bad seat in the house, and the sound quality was so amazing. Man, one of the best concerts I've ever been to. Um, I think they played a smart kid. I was like, man, wouldn't it be awesome if they played the deepest, coolest track in their catalog? It's called The Smart Kid from Stupid Dream. And they played it. Um, in fact, they played this album in its entirety for set one. They took a, you know, they took a quick break and then they came out and played all these cool songs from throughout their catalog. It absolutely blew me away. I'm so glad I got to see that show. Um, uh, so there you have it. The number two choice uh, from 2007, an absolute classic, uh, Fear of a Blank Planet. So, my number one uh, from 2002, I've got In Absentia. Uh, this is the first album on a, it's on Lava Records, but they had money on this one. So whatever Lava Records was doing at the time, or whoever they're a subsidiary of, it might be a major label. There was money for this one. Gavin Harrison is now in the fold out of nowhere. And I mean, their sound, the, the jump they made from album to album here, the jump they made from the, from the second phase to this third and final era, the jump they made from Lightbulb Sun to In Absentia is, was the biggest jump. I mean... Stephen Wilson had mentioned that for this album cycle, he had probably the best, he was coming into the studio with the best songs he'd ever written as a collection of songs. And then you add Gavin Harrison to the mix and what he could do, and that just makes just everything in there on it. They get a new record deal with money backing them. They get this incredible drummer, and Stephen happens to be writing the best collection of songs of his career. And... You get all that going on, and boom, 2002, you've got the best album, one of the best albums ever created. Uh, Blackest Eyes just comes out slamming. At this point, Stephen Wilson had produced Opeth's Blackwater Park in 01, and I hear a little bit of Opeth in some of these riffs like Blackest Eyes. Um, arguably, the best song they have is Trains, 
most popular song to have is Trank. I love that song. That's track two. There's an infamous version of him playing that live in Park West, and he breaks an acoustic string and they have to take a break. It's pretty cool. In hindsight, I'm sure he didn't like it at the time. But, uh, uh, and then that goes into a completely drifty, dreary, not dreary, but just a cool ear candy one called Lips of Ashes, which goes into the sound of Muzak, which is so catchy, with this cool drum pattern. And, just, and then that goes into Gravity Eyelids, which is one of the most overlooked, underrated, deep-cut gems of theirs. Uh, Prodigal is incredible. Uh, point three, which is what we're listening to now, which is part of a, a little medley with Strip the Soul, which is on here. Uh, let's not forget about the beautiful harmonies of Heart Attack and a Lay By. Uh, and then it ends with the beautiful Collapse the Light into Earth. Um, I mean, this album is just perfection. Um, and I ranked this number one because it was tough. They have all these classics, but if I'm stuck on a desert island and I can only listen to one Porcupine Tree album, well, it sucks that I can't listen to the other nine. This is the one I'm reaching for. So uh, coming in at number one, uh, I have, uh, from 2002, their first with Gavin Harrison and the beginning of this heavier, uh, even more progressive phase, I've got In Absentia. So, to rank them again, uh, at number 10, you have their debut from 91. You've got On the Sunday of Life. At number 9, their second album from 93, Up the Downstair. Uh, at number 8, their third album from 1995, The Sky Moves Sideways. Uh, at number 7... Uh, from 1996, their fourth album, Signify. At number six, their sixth album <laughs> from 2000, you have Light Bulb Sun. Uh, at number five, their final, tenth and final album from 2009, you have The Incident. At number four, their fifth album from 1999, you've got Stupid Dream. Uh, at number three, their uh, I don't know, what is this, their eighth album uh, from 2005, you've got Dead Wing. At number two, their ninth album from 2007, you've got Fear of a Blank Planet. And at number one, I guess this would be their seventh album from 2002, uh, you've got In Absentia. So that is ranking the ten studio albums of the awesome, one of my just all-time all favorite bands. Um, Stephen Wilson, Michael Ockerfeld, Devin Townsend, these guys are just the absolute geniuses of music. Um, a few other things, um, Octane Twisted, it's a cool uh, DVD and you get the CDs of the material, which is the DVD of The Incident, this one, The Incident, in its entirety live, I think it's very cool. So again, I've learned to appreciate The Incident big time over the years, love, uh, love that. Uh, recordings, this is leftover music from the second era, so they did Stupid Dream and Light Bulb Sun. And they had an album's worth, this came out in 01, they had an album's worth of awesome leftover material. Buying New Soul is great. Disappear is great. There's a longer version of uh, Even Lost. So these are just uh, leftover tracks from those two albums that comprise of a pretty cool album. I'd say, get this, it's all new stuff. So that's great. I love this, Stars Die the Delirium Years. Those are the, the first four albums I ranked, 10, 9, 8, 7. This is like a greatest hits, but all kinds of rare tracks. There's a track on here called Voyage 34. I thought it was a full length, but they treat it as an EP. Long track, just super drifty. It's 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 got that total orb Osric tentacles thing going on, and it's got all this propaganda albums from the US from the 60s talking about why it's not good to take uh, LSD or acid. And they just talk about like Jimmy's on his 34th trip, and this time it's a nightmare. It's hilarious and just cool and just, wow, it just reminds me of like little fluffy clouds from the orb or something like that, like the spoken word. Uh, just Rainy Taxi is a leftover track, I don't know, maybe from Up the Downstair era. You got stuff from On the Sunday of Life and Up the Downstair. You got, you know, out tracks from, I think it was This Guy Moves Sideways or Up the Downstair, Up the Down Boy. You've got Color Flow in Mind, great track. Can't believe it didn't make it to signify the album. Use the sky. There's lots of stuff from Signify. So this is just absolutely cool. The first uh, four albums were the last albums I ever got from them, but I had this first, so this is what I knew of the early era of the band for the longest time. Um, uh, so 
So I think I showed you this is a DVD of a concert from their final album and tour. But also this one's from Park West from uh, off the Deadwing era. Very cool. It's called Arriving Somewhere. I've watched this several times. This is great. I mean, it's just got, you know, plenty from Deadwing and plenty from uh, all the classic albums on here. Uh, you know, going back to, you know, going well back into the 90s. And then this is probably the best one in Esthetize. This is off of uh, Fear of a Blank Planet. And it's great. It's got stuff going back to Signify and everything in between. It's just great stuff. And then last but not least, I I got this awesome version of an Absentia. It's just this cool book. You know, four discs. There's a Blu-ray in there. Just pictures of the era of that band, of the band in that era. They came to New York to record, by the way, for that. And, uh, you know, you've got the album redone. You've got bonus material. Look at all this bonus material. Collapse Brown with me is a cool song. Orchidia, Chloroform, cool futile. Uh, in absentia demos. You've got a few songs you're not going to find anywhere else. Those are all the demos. And then you've got the the documentary directed by Lassa Hoyle, who's known for doing a lot of the artwork. In fact, I think that is Lassa Hoyle on his own cover. He's a photographer. So just that's an awesome uh, addition to the, uh, the catalog as well. So. So there you there you have it. Um, that is pretty much everything uh, pertaining to just the legendary Porcupine Tree. Just an awesome band, um, and I'd been wanting to do this episode for some time. So uh, some episodes, you know, you're not sure. You're like, well, do they have enough material to rank? Well, Porcupine Tree just this is a perfect amount of awesome classic albums, ten albums, and all these other things. So uh, so there you go. Uh, that is ranking and discussing uh, the albums and the music of uh, the legendary Porcupine Tree. Uh, if you can, definitely check out Stephen Wilson's solo work. Uh, Gavin Harrison is now still in uh, King Crimson and also The Pineapple Thief. And uh, the other guys are doing uh, different things as well. So, uh, But there you have it. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, I will see you next time.